It's 1996. I'm in my mid-20s and I'm living in Beijing. And I am on top of the world. You see, I have been recruited by this global telecommunications company to be on this fast track, fancy executive training program where you're rotated from different roles and different business units and different geographies around the world. The intent to one day become a leader. And so I was ambitious. I started in Calgary. I went to Toronto. I went to Raleigh, North Carolina. I went to London, England. And now I was in Beijing. Here I was with a very fancy job, being chauffeured around the world, and making a lot of money. And that was really important to me. You see, I had grown up in a very large, a very poor family in a small village at the end of the highway in northern Saskatchewan. That's Canada, by the way. <laughs> and this village was just over 200 people, mostly people from Europe who had escaped from some sort of persecution or war along the way. And my father and his parents were no different. They had escaped from Prague in World War II. And so my father always said to us growing up, I do not blame Hitler for what happened, because there will always be a Hitler in this world. I blame everyone else who stood around and watched, who did not take the time to get educated on what was going on in this world, who did not debate it, who did not come up with a truth, and then who did not stand up for that truth, and stand up for those who could not stand up for themselves. So your job in life is to go out and get educated on what's going on in this world. So here I was. I had had a pretty amazing journey around the world already, and I was making money. And that was really important to me. From a girl who came from the sticks. This was it. I was on track. Until one day, it all changed. I was going to this big conference at the International Beijing University. And I was dropped off at the gates. So I had to walk through the forest to get there. And during my walk, I was bit by a bug. I was literally bit by a bug in Beijing. And that wasn't no love bug, let me tell you. Within 24 hours, I landed in the International Health Clinic. I was lying in bed. I had the shakes. I was clammy. I couldn't keep my eyes open because the light hurt my eyes. And the doctor came in, sat by my bedside, and he said, I said, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I think you have meningitis and something else I don't know. We've done all that we can for you here, and we don't think you're going to make it. We're going to have to send you over to the local Beijing hospital. And I said to him, no, 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 you, you can't do that. You don't understand. If you send me there, I will die. He said, I'm sorry, but if you stay here, you will die. So I had no choice. I went over to the local Beijing hospital. They put, they prodded, they did a spinal tap, no anesthetic, no sterilization, and the prognosis came back the same. We don't know what you have, but we don't think you're going to make it. At which point then I was there back to a hospital in Hong Kong. Poked and prodded, poked and prodded. And the prognosis came back the same. We don't know what you have, but we don't think you're going to make it. And at that point, I got really angry. How can this be? How can I be working in such an advanced industry where we're talking about ordering sodas from vending machines with our cell phones, but you cannot take a blood test and figure out what I have? How can we send men to the moon, but you cannot figure out what I have? This is insanity. And it was then the penny dropped. This was my time. And it did not matter how fancy my title was or what I wore. It did not matter who I knew or how much money I had. All that mattered at that moment was a question. 
had I lived my life well. And listen, in many respects, I had no regrets. I had lived large. I had done more in my life than most people ever dream of. And I had lived my father's dream. I had lived my father's dream. So, meanwhile, this big global corporation could not have this young little thing die amazing on them. That was just not going to do. So they brought in a foreign disease specialist from the UK, and he discovered there was an outbreak of streptitis between uh, Korea and China. And, and I was part of that, and because my immune system was compromised, I got meningitis and myocarditis, but then they got me on the right therapy, and in a couple of months, I was better. I had survived. I can't tell you what that feeling was like. And then the next penny dropped. In the sentence of death, I had received the gift of life. I had a second chance. I had a chance to find my dream, to live my dream. And I decided at that moment that that experience was very personal to me, it was very unique to me, and that it became my passion, my purpose. And that was to make the healthcare industry as advanced, as sexy as the tech industry. I was going to level that playing field. I had had a chance to personally experience it, and now I was going to take it on. So how to do that? I'm not a biologist. I'm not a chemist. I'm not going to cure cancer or HIV or hepatitis C myself. But I had a good business brain. So I decided to take it on from a business perspective. And I went back to what I knew. So I looked at an IT company, what it takes to commercialize an IT company. You have a couple of guys, a couple of computers, a couple hundred thousand dollars, and in a couple of years they can turn it into a company they can sell to Microsoft or Yahoo or Google for $200 million. Not that that doesn't have societal value. But let's compare it to a life science industry or a life science company. Before a life science company even turns the lights on, it takes at least a year and millions of dollars to set up a specialized facility. Uh, capital equipment, a specialized operations team, and then, and even then, it takes what? Eight to 12 years to get a drug to market. And what's the current stats for how much money? 2.2 billion? Oh, no, 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 no. That's an old stat. We're up to $11 billion to get a drug to market. Now, let's think about that. From a business perspective, what scientist in their right mind would start a company? By the time you get to market, if you ever get there, you are so deluded, the only thing you're making is a difference, and folks, that's not sustainable. You think about it from an investor's perspective. Before they can get an exit to a pharma who can actually take it all the way to market, so let's say you put in $500 million, so in five to eight years you can sell it for a billion dollars. Let's compare that to Instagram, for example. <laughs> Instagram, March 2010, gets $500,000. Two years later, sells to Facebook, Facebook for $1 billion. Now, which investor would you rather be? No wonder. We have a problem. So I decided to take on that problem. I didn't want scientists to have to spend a year and millions of dollars to get all of this infrastructure set up. I would set it up for many scientists. So I set up my first center in the Bay Area. 40,000 square feet, half the space was common research space. The other half the space were individual wet lab modules ranging from 100 square feet to 500 to 1,000 to 1,500. All of those suites had adjoining doors, so you could grow as you had the money to grow. I had a specialized operations team that did everything for those companies except for the science, so they could keep their IP. I brought in educational programming so we could teach the scientists how to fish. And then I brought the money to the table. I brought different organizations that had a need, a desire for this innovation, that had the money for it, and I created a marketplace. 
I brought in granting agencies, disease foundations, venture capitalists, pharma. And with that, we created an entire ecosystem that allowed companies to get started faster, cheaper, and easier. In this model, a scientist could get started in 24 hours with as little as $500 a month. We changed the investment profile of this industry. We brought in companies from around the world. And over the course of eight years, those companies raised $2 billion. That's testimony to investment saying, yeah, that's de-risked, that makes sense. In fact, we had one company that showed that we could cut the cost and time of development by at least 50%. They came in, a couple of guys, 1,000 square feet. They wanted to create a new prenatal diagnostic so that you could change from the current invasive method, which was dangerous and potentially fatal to the fetus and certainly stressful for the mother, to a simple blood test. Mm -hmm. huh, we're back to the blood test. So these guys thought it would take them three years to get up to 5,000 square feet and 35 people before they could raise their next big round and move into their own building. In our model, they reached that milestone in eight months. And they moved into their own building, got over $50 million in funding, and they were on the market in two years. That was changing the investment profile. So are we successful? So far, so good. Have we solved the problem? Not even close. Because the magnitude of the problem in the healthcare industry is so large, we've only just begun. So we need to expand, we need to scale. Well, so it's time to go somewhere else. And I decided I needed to go to a community that was not just rich in science, but was rich in purpose. And so my next stop was San Diego. <laughs> and in this community, I'm not just found that kind of purpose. I found a partner, because this is hard to do on your own. It's expensive. I found a corporate partner that has a, had as much passion for this purpose as we did. And not only did they have passion for the purpose, they had the kind of entrepreneurial spirit and commitment I usually only saw in early stage companies. So I partnered with Johnson & Johnson's pharmaceutical division of Janssen and we created Janssen Labs here in San Diego. And in Janssen Labs, we've been open, oh, it'll be six months next week. And we have had over 200 companies from around the world want to come here to San Diego, to Janssen Labs. And as of next week, we'll be about 70% occupied. In fact, we could have filled the center upon opening because what we have will help these scientists realize their dreams, create an impact to the patient. So, are we successful? So far, so good. Have we solved the problem? Just getting started. We still have a long ways to go because the problem continues to grow every day. But with that, I ask, I ask myself, are we on track? Absolutely. And then I asked myself this. Am I on track? Am I living my life well? And I have to because I've been left with a legacy from the bug that means that every day I have the smell of death in my nose. And it's a very powerful thing and it allows me to walk through walls. When there are problems with what we're doing, I just go back to this place here and I can walk through walls, whether they are drywalls or brick walls or titanium walls. And that makes all the difference in the world. But here's the thing, death and disease do not discriminate. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your bug is coming. And when that bug hits you, everything else will fall away. And the only question that will matter for you 
is whether you are living your life well. And only you can answer that question. But I encourage you not to wait till that moment to ask yourself that question, because at that moment, it is too late. You need to ask yourself that question today, because when it happens, you want to be at that moment, and your answer needs to give you 